Hello, I'm Dr. Jeremy Stovall, Professor of Civil Culture at Stephen F. Austin State University. And today we'll be talking about old growth forest structure at the Mill Creek Cove old growth site. Uh, this is part of the Sabine National Forest. Uh, it's a national scenic area, as you see on the sign here. And we're actually out on a peninsula of the Toledo Bend Reservoir on the west side. So we're on the Texas side, and this peninsula is jutting east into the reservoir. Um, this land has no evidence of past logging or disturbance by people. Uh, that being said, you know, we've built a reservoir and raised the water level all around uh, the peninsula, so it certainly had impacts by people. We're here today to discuss old growth forest structure. Um, so there's one term I want to go over first uh, that causes confusion commonly. It's the difference between old growth and virgin forest. And so virgin forest is really an anthropogenic or a man-made concept with the idea that people just have not cut trees in that forest. So some folks like to focus on that a lot. We're not really worried about that today. We're not worried if people have cut much timber in here or not. The belief is that not much timber has been cut on this particular stand. But what we're worried about is old growth forest structure. So today we'll be talking about a suite of different structural traits that describe what makes up an old growth forest. With forestry, we describe forest cover types by the dominant forest species found. Old growth forests are characterized by a great diversity in both overstory, midstory, and understory species. But when we talk about the cover type, again, we're really just looking for the two or three most common overstory species. This stand is a very rare cover type. It's a beech magnolia cover type. And so if we look on my left here, we see an American beech, Phagaceae fagus grandifolia. And if we look on my right, we see regenerating southern magnolia uh, seedlings and saplings. So that's Magnoliaceae, Magnolia grandiflora. So this is a rare combination we find in some places along the southern coastal plain, including East Texas. So old growth forests are rare in the eastern United States, particularly in the southern United States. Beach magnolia cover types are rare in the southern United States. So for us to find this beach magnolia forest in an old growth condition is really pretty remarkable. Okay, so in an old growth forest, we already have a really good sense of one of the most important structural characteristics we want to look for. Everybody likes big trees. We want to see big trees. We want to see a lot of big trees per acre. But there's two important questions we need to answer. How big a tree is a big tree? And how many do we really need before it's an old growth forest? And the answer to that is pretty simple, and you're going to hear it a lot in silviculture. It depends. So when I look around here, if, if I brought, you know, three or four researchers out here that were studying old growth forests, you'd get 10 or 12 different answers on what those cutoffs should be. It probably varies regionally by cover type, by how big the trees get in a particular area. So you need a lot of big trees, what that number is. We don't have a firm threshold on what a big tree is. It might be two foot DBH, it might be three foot DBH. If you're using metric units, it might be 50 centimeters, which is going to be close to, uh, you know, a little less than two feet. It, it really varies widely. Uh, but, you know, treat it like what we talked about in dendrology. How do you define a tree? Well, we're all foresters. You know a tree when you see a tree. How do you define a big tree? You know a big tree when you see a big tree. All right, this is one of the largest magnolia trees that we have found in this stand. It's very structurally complex. It's hollow. It looks like a lot of the top has broken out, but it still has a fair bit of canopy to it. But what's really impressive is just the overall size of this tree. So here's the diameter on it. It's 44.1 inches in DBH. So absolutely enormous, tons of volume, probably really old. But we can't tell that without increment coring it, of course, right? Some trees may have great genetics and grow on really good soil, and that's why they get so big pretty quickly. But just incredible complexity to this tree. If you were looking at this tree from higher up in the crown, you would think it was two or three trees based on how it forks here 15 or so feet off the ground. Okay, so we're looking at a loblolly pine here in our stand. So clearly our forest has not lost all members of what was likely the pioneer cohort. We do have some pine component. But these pines are really impressive uh, in their size and in the structural complexity they've grown into in this old growth forest. So I have a D-tape on here and you can see 
This pine is about 32 and a half inches DBH. So it's not even the largest pine that we're seeing out here today or the largest tree we're seeing out here today. But if you look at the complexity just at this level, look at the bark thickness. So here's a pocket knife with about a two inch long blade on it. This bark is more than two inches thick in places on this loblolly pine. So you end up with the large tree with the complex crown, but beyond the crown complexity, the bark forms all sorts of habitat for different insects and other wildlife species. You might have bats roosting under plates, um, all sorts of different wildlife interactions with just the complexity of the bark on here. We don't tend to think of many bryophytes growing on pines. Uh, we're not quite sure why, but with complexity like this, that even might start changing a little. And so you end up just with, even in a small scale within an old growth forest, structural complexity and diversity. Another important feature in old growth forests is going to be large and complex canopies, particularly on your largest tree. So you can see this pine above me here. This pine has a canopy that may cover a quarter of an acre. It's absolutely huge. The limbs are huge. And what you'll find up in a crown like this is a whole new ecosystem. There may be bryophytes, herbaceous plants, and wildlife taxa that are only found up in the big crown of a large tree like this in an old growth forest, and they're not found down at the bottom of a forest from a structural standpoint. Mortality in trees is complex. Here's a very large magnolia that got to tremendous size, but as you'll notice, almost all of the tree has broken out and fallen down. Um, so density independent mortality, again, is gonna be a key mode of replacing cohorts in an old growth forest. But if you'll notice, this magnolia is not dead yet. It's still very much alive. Um, it's still sprouting, it still has live roots, live cambium, live phloem in parts of the tree, and it has live leaves. It may well be grafted into root systems of other magnolias around here, we don't know. And so as we look at this tree, it's on its way out. We have a lot of regeneration occurring around it in the gap that formed when this large canopy uh, was removed from the overstory. But again, it's forming more structure in our old growth forest. This is hollow. So this is great habitat for bear denning and all sorts of other wildlife species to take cover. You may be having some trouble seeing me right now, and that's intentional to illustrate one of the properties of an old growth forest. Old growth forests by their very nature are uneven aged. And that's driven in large part in many cover types in the United States, including the Speech Magnolia cover type, by gap formation and gap expansion. So we're standing in a gap that has been expanding over the last several decades. And with gap formation, it's a messy process. You can't draw it out clearly and easily using simple geometry. It's messy. It's stochastic. So when people think about old growth forests, Often in their mind's eye, what they're thinking of is a park, an even-aged, open-canopied forest, savanna-like that you could walk through. That's not what old growth is. This is what old growth is. You can't see two feet in some spots. You have so many young trees regenerating in an old gap. In other areas, it may be open and park-like. And in many other areas, it's somewhere in between. So at this particular spot, you see on my left a very large ash tree, about 30 inches in DBH. It's still alive and it's doing very well. So there's an older cohort. That tree is easily in excess of 100 years old. Around me over here, you see a dead tree down on the right. Uh, can't tell what species it is anymore. It's lost all its bark and it's rotten. Um, but as you look at it, it died who knows how long ago. But that has started forming this gap. Uh, behind the camera over there, you can't see, but there's a snag, another tree that's died more recently. It hasn't fallen down yet. And so this gap has formed. This gap is expanding because when this tree went, it opened up another tree to being hit by wind. And so it just it expands that disturbance impact. And then what happens after that disturbance? Well, this tree falls down. Now we have light here where we once would have been standing in dense shade. And that light allows trees like this American holly right here or like this magnolia right here on my left. It allows them to establish. They're able to germinate. They're able to grow. They're able to survive. So this little patch here, all these dense young saplings, they compete with one another in the environment that they're in down here 
and eventually they'll make it back up and some of them will win and become dominant trees in this forest once again. So we have older cohorts with that ash tree. We have younger cohorts with this holly, with this uh, southern magnolia. We have down dead trees. We have standing dead trees. Old growth forests are messy. Gaps are messy, but this is really a great example of what an old growth forest looks like, especially here in East Texas in this beech magnolia cover type. Here we see an area that's clearly dominated by an older cohort. We have several very large beaches right here. And you can see the intense shade that we're standing in in this spot. Um, as I look around, if I were to put in a point sample right here and take a basal area using a prism or another angle gauge, you might have a spot like this where your basal area could easily be 100, 200 square feet per acre. But if I put a fixed area plot right here, Say I happen to have a, a tenth of an acre plot fall right in this particular spot. You know, look at the cross-sectional area of these trees. Remember, a 10-inch DBH tree has slightly more than half a square foot per acre of basal area. As you look at these trees in the 20, 30-inch size classes, even up to 40 inches in this stand, each one of these trees might represent several square feet of basal area. So if you scaled that up in a tenth of an acre of a plot, the expansion factor would be 10. All of a sudden, you could have a plot that has three or 400 square feet per acre of basal area just in that one isolated spot. So you end up with some areas in an old growth forest where the old growth canopy dominates. You have a lot of big trees at a really, really high density like you see here and very little in the lower crown positions. It's much more open here than in other places we've seen in this stand. So we've seen that uneven age forests have a lot of horizontal heterogeneity or complexity. They're messy. But let's think about the vertical component as well. Because you have multiple cohorts of trees, old trees, middle aged trees, young trees, they're different heights. And because they're at different heights, you have a lot of vertical complexity in an uneven aged forest as well. One key hallmark of this you can look for in an uneven aged forest is that you have a vertically continuous canopy. And what that means is from the top of your tallest tree down to the forest floor, you have leaves at every single level. Now you don't have leaves at every single level all on the same tree. Those really large trees may be pruned up real high. Uh, the little seedlings obviously can only have leaves down near the forest floor, but some tree in your stand will have leaves at absolutely every height throughout the forest. And so as you look for that vertically continuous canopy, it'll be even more complex here in the southern U.S. with vines on many of our trees. Uh, so that just adds even more complexity to this. So then you combine the two, horizontal heterogeneity, vertical heterogeneity. And I'll show you this gap. And as we look around this gap, what you'll notice is it's a complete and total mess. Uh, in the background, you see those really tall trees. In the middle of the gap where trees have died and fallen down, we have really dense vegetation. On the edges of the gap, again, you get back into those large trees. So again, a complete and total mess. Old growth forests, again, are not that even aged open woodland that you might see that and think that it's a park like our pecan park here in Agadocious. They're not necessarily a stand you really want to easily hike through or walk through. Pit and mound topography is a major feature of many old growth forests where wind disturbance is a common means of mortality. And so you can see when a tree first tips over, where maybe it had shallow roots, often because there's a, a layer below right here that's too wet, or in some parts of the world it may be too rocky that they can root into it well. Well, it rains a lot, the soil loses strength, you get a high wind event, and the tree tips over. So the tree is on the other side of this mound going straight that way, away from the camera. And so you can see it's pulled up this enormous volume of soil. Uh, this, this is probably several cubic yards, several tons of soil. Um, and it creates this huge pit. I'm standing in a pit right now. I'm probably three feet below the average layer uh, of the, the surface. And so as we've gone through this old growth forest today, 
We've seen numerous old pits and mounds where the tree is completely rotted away and it's a small mound and it's a small pit because they've weathered over time. The rain has caused erosion. They've broken down over time. This is what the big ones look like when they first form. Uh, you can see this thing is about 10 feet tall from the bottom of the pit to the top of the mound. It's easily 15 feet wide. So it's just an absolutely enormous volume of soil. Now, when this forms, it's a very important means of uh, pedogenesis, where it creates soil by mixing soil, pedoturbation, the mixing of soil. And so it's a very important soil process uh, in a forested landscape. It's one of the ways that soil becomes mixed over time. Uh, and then it gives you clues to the landscape. If you find an area in some parts of the country where you see those old pits and mounds, you know that the land was never put into row crop agriculture and plowed because the plowing would have destroyed that topography. So it gives you evidence centuries later as to the land use history in that particular area. When we look at what it does ecologically, if you'll notice the top of this mound, there are small uh, southern magnolia saplings that are already growing on the top of this. So this tree has gone down. You see all the sunlight I'm standing in here. It's opened up the canopy. Now we've got disturbed soil. They're growing like that. Some of those trees may not make it because the soil is going to slough off and break down as this, this uh, mound eventually works its way back here into the pit. But let's talk about the pit a little bit here. Um, in many soil textures, you may have enough clay. It gets a little bit impermeable. And often in winter around here and even in spring, sometimes in fall, these pits may st have standing water in them. They're vestigial pools. And so those pools may be habitat for herps like frogs, like salamanders. In other parts of the country where you may have snow in the winter that would drift up over this, bears will dig down into the snow and den um, in these to seek cover. And so it just forms a ton of great habitat for different wildlife species. So this right here is a fantastic example of a fresh pit and mound. And again, be looking as you walk through an old growth forest and even a forest in understory reinitiation. You'll see these, but if they're really old, they'll be pretty small and pretty moderated. So we've been discussing pit and mound topography and how you can use it to read the history of an old growth forest. And here's an example where the story becomes even more complex. So I'm right here in a pit and on my right you see a mound uh, of soil. So what would have happened here is a large tree growing in this spot would have fallen that way to my right. And it would have left this pit where the roots pulled out and the mound over here. But as we see there's a very large down tree going this way and there's no pit over there. So what it appears happened is a very large tree fell that way decades and decades and decades ago. It has rotted to the point it no longer exists. In the meantime, this tree germinated, established, grew to this large size. This tree is about two and a half feet in diameter. And then it fell the other way, perhaps because it was in an unstable rooting position. So this pit is left over from decades ago from a tree that no longer exists but we still have evidence of it on the landscape. And this tree has fallen in the completely other direction. So we're seeing multiple generations of trees in this forest, evidence of them, all in one spot right here. Dead trees from density independent mortality are a hallmark of old growth forest structure. Um, we've seen how those trees can be snags where they're standing and dead. Um, they can also be down and dead, and this is a really important component of forest structure. And so here we see a very large down dead, looks like it was probably a water oak or a willow oak. Um, it's got different epiphytes growing in already. It's getting kind of punky. It's, it's forming soil in places. And so this will form habitat structure for wildlife, and this will form basically structure where all sorts of different species can germinate on these trees. So there are some species, such as some birches, like yellow birch, that are known in their native range to like to germinate on top of rotting logs. It forms pretty neat structure. We don't have yellow birch here in the southern coastal plain. But when it does that, it, it'll germinate on the log, then the log will rot away. And when you see that tree years or decades later, it has these stilt roots. Where it was rooted through the rotting log, the log is now gone, and so it looks like it's propped up on stilts, and then the tree starts like you would normally see it at ground line. So that structure is an interesting attribute of old growth forests. The downwoody debris is important for carbon storage. 
uh, great for uh, refurbishing the soil, replenishing the soil with nutrients, organic matter, and so lots of uh, important attributes to down dead woody material, both small diameter and particularly large diameter like this tree. We're looking at the base of that same large magnolia that we've seen. Um, and this is a great illustration of another property you see in old growth forests. Here in the southern United States, our decomposition rates are very high. And so we don't build up very thick litter layers. But look under here. I'm not just showing you my boot by mistake with the camera. We're doing this on purpose. Look under here, and you'll see you've got all this leaf litter underneath this magnolia before you get down to the mineral soil. It may be several inches thick. It really crunches as you walk around on it. And so we don't have thick litter layers in the south, but in an old growth forest, they might be thicker than you would see in many other stand types in our region. So in this spot, you can see we have a lot of nice beech trees. We see magnolia in this stand as well. So our cover type may be beech magnolia, but as you look around this area, we're noticing really different stand structures than what we observed uh, throughout today's tour of the Mill Creek Cove Old Growth Forest. As we look around here, we're wide open in the understory. We have a pretty open midstory. And so this right here was most likely cut out. There There's some very large stumps in here. And so this area was likely cut out and has regenerated as an even age stand, but with a some, somewhat similar cover type. And so you have some trees that are small and large, but as you start looking around, species composition is more likely to account for that uh, than age of origin. If we started coring trees around here, odds are very good that you would find this to be an even aged forest. And so we may have many of the same species. We're lacking the really big trees. We're lacking the different cohorts. We're lacking a lot of the down dead woody debris. We're lacking a lot of the standing dead snags. Our litter layer is not as thick. We don't have as much pit and mound topography being formed because you need really large trees for that. And so you can see this is a nice forest, but it's in the understory reinitiation phase of stand development. This is not an old growth forest.